Welcome everybody to this GLOBE webinar on transatlantic perspectives on uh, WTO reform challenges and opportunities for uh, MC12 with Mr. Ignacio Garcia Barquero and uh, Professor Kathleen Clausen, which will be moderated by Dr. Guillaume van der Loo, who will introduce the theme and the speakers of today uh, in a few minutes. It's my great uh, pleasure that many of you can join from many countries around the world. My name is Axel Marx, and I'm uh, working at the Louvre Center for Global Governance Studies, which hosts today's webinar. The webinar is an organization of the GLOBE Project and the America Europe Fund. The GLOBE Project stands for Global Governance and the European Union Future Trends and Scenarios. It is funded by the European Commission Horizon 2020 program. And in the project, we seek to understand the constraints and opportunities for the European Union in promoting its interests and values through global governance. And we provide a specific uh, focus on issue areas like international uh, trade and try to identify future developments. The America Europe Fund was established at the University of Leuven in October 2020, and it's hosted by the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies. The drivers inspiring the setting up of the fund include uh, a, a request and um, a, a need on both sides of the Atlantic to have a broader and deeper knowledge of each, each other's political, economic, and legal systems, but also very important to the different approaches to international affairs, including um, uh, global trade governance. The fund supports academic cooperation and exchanges, program and research at the University of Leuven and actually hopes, and strength, hopes to strengthen comparative knowledge of European and American societies and collaboration between uh, American and European universities. During this webinar, you will be able to join the debate and you can have your questions uh, in the chat box and in the Q&A box so that we can feed them uh, into the discussions of, of, of the webinar. Before I hand over to uh, Guillaume, maybe one more uh, uh, small announcement. And that is that within the Louvre Center for Global Governance Studies, uh, we are launching a webinar series on the future of trade governance. As many of you know, global trade governance consists of many different organizations, institutions, and initiatives, which on the one hand aim to facilitate global trade, but also on the other hand, to try to integrate non-trade objectives in global trade governance. These organizations and institutions include the World Trade Organization, on which we focus today, but also G7 and G20, bilateral trade agreements, and many other types of initiatives. And in the webinar series, we want to look at the development in these institutions and organizations and the challenges and opportunities they face. In the next months, we will organize a series of webinars uh, on these specific uh, institutions and organizations. Today, we will focus on the WTO. So, Welcome again from our side, from the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies. And now it's my great pleasure uh, to hand over to Guillaume. Many thanks, Axel, for this kind introduction. Um, I don't know if you can hear me? Yes. OK, perfect. So also on my behalf, welcome to this GLOBE webinar on a transatlantic perspectives on WTO reform. I'm Guillaume van der Loo, and I'm a research fellow at the Egmont Institute and European Policy Center. Uh, the subject of concern today, uh, WTO form and uh, transatlantic views on WTO form are obviously very timely, uh, considering that we are less than two weeks before the MC12 for the uh, ministerial conference, which will finally take place uh, in Geneva uh, from 12 to 15 June. Now, uh, as we know, I mean, the multilateral uh, trading system with the WTO at its center is in uh, its deepest crisis, maybe since uh, the WTO's creation more than a quarter of a century ago. Uh, increasing trade tensions between WTO members, the applet body crisis, uh, the trade-related implications of the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine have really amplified the need to update and inform uh, the WTO. And obviously, as key WTO members, the EU and US are basically in the driving seat or are crucial players in this reform process. Uh, as you may know, the EU has already outlined uh, a comprehensive proposal for WTO reform uh, in the context of its 2001 trade policy review. Um, and actually, tomorrow, uh, there is a, a Foreign Affairs Council on trade where ministers uh, will discuss WTO reform and, and the preparations for MC12 here in, in Brussels. Now, under the 
Biden administration, the EU and the US uh, rebooted uh, a bit transatlantic trade relations and, and developed a broad and ambitious trade agenda, uh, as for example, recently evidenced in the second meeting of the new Trade and Technology Council. But with regard to the WTO, I think it's fair to say that both the EU and the US share a, a lot of concerns with regard to the WTO, for example, on trade and health, trade and climate, uh, on uh, China's trade distortive practices, uh, but that very often they have a different or a slightly different view on actually how to address this. Uh, or there are some issues where the US or the new Biden administration still needs to take a new uh, clear position, such as on the, on the dispute settlement uh, body. Um, however, both the EU and US have recently submitted jointly or uh, as co-sponsors together several joint statements or initiatives uh, at the WTO on, for example, the notification process on trade and agriculture, uh, the TRIPS waiver for COVID-19 vaccinations, and so on and so forth. Now, it is expected or hoped for that WTO members will launch a WTO reform process at MC12, but it is, not still, it is still not clear how this could or should uh, look like. There are a lot of issues on the agenda, fishery subsidies, the package or a package on trade and health, agriculture, WTO reform, the e-commerce moratorium and, and several other issues. So um, there's a lot to discuss. Uh, so in this men and in this webinar, as uh, Axel already mentioned, we will really focus on the transatlantic uh, perspectives on this or challenges, opportunities for transatlantic cooperation on WTO reform. And we are very happy to have two leading experts with us um, to from, from both sides of the Atlantic. Um, we have with us. Uh, we are pleased to have with us, uh, Mr. Ignacio Garcia Bercero. Ignacio is director um, at DG Trade in charge of multilateral affairs, strategic and economic analysis uh, at DG Trade of the European Commission. Ignacio is already active, uh, actually since the, since the same year that I was born. So basically, my entire life uh, at European Commission at DG Trade, where he had held several senior positions at DG Trade. He was, for example, chief negotiator on several important trade agreements, including on, on, on TTIP. He was also head of unit on, um, uh, on head of unit on, on the unit on WTO dispute settlements and is uh, actually one of the leading voices within the commission and within DG Trade on WTO and WTO reform. And moreover, Ignacio has also um, produced interesting academic uh, research on, on, on WTO reform, which I can only recommend. Uh, and we're also very pleased to have with us Professor Kathleen Clausen, uh, who is Professor of Law at the University of Miami, the School of Law. Uh, she has worked and published uh, intensively on, on trade, investment, international uh, dispute settlement. Uh, she has been a visiting researcher or research fellow at various universities and research institutes all over the world, including uh, the World Trade Institute, Cambridge University, i and, and so on and so forth. And, um, also prior to, or basically before her uh, academic career uh, and joining the Miami uh, law faculty, um, Professor Colossian was Associate General Counsel at USTR, where she represented the US in trade disputes or trade dispute proceedings. I was a legal advisor uh, for the US in international trade negotiations. Uh, she was recently appointed um, uh, as uh, to the dispute settlement labor roster for the United States, Mexico, Canada trade agreements. And from 2020 to 21, she served as uh, an invited member of the Biden Harris uh, transition team. So um, it's fair to say that we have a stellar panel and uh, we have two speakers who are perfectly placed to, um, to walk us or discuss with us uh, uh, the subject of concern of today. So I propose, Ignacio, that we start with you and that you kick off uh, in, uh, in a 10 ish minutes uh, opening statement and that we then give the floor to, to, to Kathleen. So please, Ignacio, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Guillaume. And first of all, thanks a lot uh, for having me here. This is really a great opportunity to discuss uh, WTO reform two weeks before the, we have uh, the first WTO ministerial meeting in nearly five years, a little bit more than four years. And the last WTO ministerial meeting in Buenos Aires did not produce much in terms of multilateral outcomes. I think it is very clear that the WTO is facing a very serious existential crisis and that it is going to be really important that we can use the ministerial meeting in two weeks' time to begin to regain confidence in the function of the WTO as an institution and to set up a process of WTO reform. Now, I'm not going to enter into the details about what is going to be discussed in two weeks in Geneva. I will be happy, of course, in the debate, and I see quite a few 
big WTO experts among the audience. I think uh, I would say they'll be looking forward to the to the questions. I will be happy to go into the details about what is going to be discussed. But if you want me to summarize, uh, it will be important to show that the WTO as a multilateral organization is relevant when it comes to tackling global trade challenges. That's what I think in my view, there are three big uh, global trade challenges at this point in time to being faced by the global community. There is the response uh, to COVID-19. There is the whole challenge about food security, which is becoming a huge uh, problem as a result uh, of the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation. And there is, of course, the challenges relating to sustainability. So these are the three big uh, global challenges. And what will be important to see is to what extent the WTO members multilaterally are able to agree relevant responses to those challenges and to set up a process of WTO reform. I think those are, I believe, the three, the, the four big issues which are going to be in the agenda. And as I said, I would be happy to go into more detail when we come to the questions and answers. But what I would like is to do is to take a little bit of a step back and to start by saying why for the European Union to WTO reform and the WTO as an institution to continues to be a first priority when it comes to trade policy. Now, we are, of course, living in a very different world to that of 1995. We are living in a world of increasing geopolitical tensions. Even without talking about the world in Europe, it is clear that the US-China geopolitical conflict is having a huge impact on the global uh, on the global trading system. And for a, our point of view, the fact that we are living in a world which is much more geopolitically tense also makes it imperative to see how we can define a space for cooperation in multilateral institutions. Because we continue to be convinced that rule-based trade is essential if we want to avoid a total fragmentation of the global economy. Of course, there has to be a readiness to compete with China, and there are going to be conflicts, but we believe that despite that, that also should be a space for cooperation, and that what is being provided for in the context of the, of the WTO. So this is the very difficult environment in which we need to handle. I continue to be, by the way, totally convinced that transatlantic cooperation is going to be key if we actually want to influence the evolution of the WTO in a direction which is consonant with our interests and our values. It doesn't mean that just simply because we agree on something between the United States and the European Union, then things are solved. It is a much more complex world out there. But at the same time, it is very clear that if we are not able to agree between the United States and the European Union, it is going to be extremely difficult to advance in the WTO reform agenda. We are going to have to, have to engage with China, we are going to have to engage with India. We're going to have to engage uh, with South Africa and African countries. It's a very complex world, that of multilateral diplomacy. But uh, close cooperation between the United States and the European Union continues to be, from my point of view, one of the key elements to be able to influence the WTO reform agenda in the, in the, right, in the right direction. So what it is that uh, the WTO reform agenda could include? I mean, first, let me be clear, we are interested in reform, not because we are just interested in institutions per se. We are interested in reform because we believe that there needs to be a multilateral institution which can respond to global challenges. And that is the function that the WTO this, uh, the, uh, represents. And that's the function for which, quite frankly, there is no alternative at this point in time. Regional trade agreements uh, play a role but regional trade agreements cannot replace the role of the, w, of the WTO. Now, so what is the, what the, the WTO reform agenda should entail? And where do I see the scope for cooperation to, between the United States and the European Union? It is very clear that one of the fundamental challenges that we are facing is that we no longer have a functioning dispute settlement system in the WTO. The essence of the WTO is a rule-based institution and you cannot have a rule-based institution without having a functioning dispute settlement system. 
It is not just that you need to have mechanisms to enforce the rules. It's also that you need to have the overall stability that comes from knowing that if you actually have a problem in terms of enforcement of the rules, you have a credible mechanism to arbitrate uh, differences. So we uh, continue to attach the utmost importance to find a way forward uh, on the reform of the WTO dispute settlement. We are open-minded uh, to engage in a serious discussion with the United States and others about what changes are needed to make the system uh, work better. At the same time, it is very clear to us that any system of dispute settlement needs to maintain the key elements that were there in 1995. We need to have a system which is binding. We need to have a system which is based uh, on independent adjudication, and we need to have a two-tier system of review. Now, this doesn't mean that we are just simply saying we need to keep the status quo. We are fully uh, cognizant that the United States has a number of concerns about the functioning of the dispute settlement uh, system. And we are quite open to enter into a discussion to see how we can actually agree on ways of finding the system which is more effective, which is legitimate, and which at the same time provide the necessary stability for a rule-based trading system. Now, while dispute settlement is important, I think it would be a big mistake to think that the WTO is all about negotiating binding rules and about the enforcement of negotiating of, 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 the, of those rules. A lot of the work in the WTO happens in committees. A lot of the work on the WTO is a work which is of the nature of ensuring transparency of trade policies, which is of the nature that ensuring that you have a space for policy deliberation. And quite frankly, when you look into some of the important uh, challenges ahead of us, like the interaction between trade and climate policies, or indeed the interaction between trade and social development. This is not necessarily going to be about negotiating rules. It's going to be a lot about having the space to discuss those issues seriously among governments in a multilateral setting and trying to make a way of the WTO committee structure working better. It is one of the important objectives of WTO reform. And quite frankly, my sense uh, having listened uh, to several presentations by Ambassador Tai, is that this is probably a vision which is also shared uh, by, by, by the United States. Now, better functioning of the WTO committees. And of course, another important uh, question is how to revitalize the WTO as a negotiating uh, forum. Now, the days of big uh, negotiating rounds, uh, single undertakings are over. If they ever were the right way forward, one can discuss where it was really the right approach try to have a big global trade negotiation when we launched the DDA. But it's very clear that those days are over. And if it comes to actually modernizing the WTO rule book, a lot is going to depend about the flexibility of the WTO to accommodate uh, open plurilateral agreements. There's a lot of energy actually at this point in time in Geneva in negotiations on issues like uh, e-commerce, uh, investment facilitation, on trying to see how to move forward uh, the trade and environment, trade and climate agenda. And these are not going to be negotiations in which all WTO members are going to participate. But provided that the negotiations are open, provided that the interests of non-members are not harmed, that should be the flexibility within the WTO to accommodate those open plurilateral agreements. Now, this is not a view which is necessarily shared by all WTO members. Though there are more than 100 members participating in different plurilateral initiatives. But I think this is, from our point of view, one of the key elements to ensure that the WTO remains a dynamic institution and that the rules of international trade can be, can be modernized. Now, what I have mentioned so far can be considered to be an institutional agenda, but it is clear that WTO reform also needs to tackle some of the substantive issues which have underlined the current difficulty of moving things forward in the WTO. And a lot of these have to do with different perspectives about the interaction between WTO rules and development. Now, development is obviously at the center of the discussions in a multilateral institution like, like the WTO. And at the end of the day, you really need to have a serious and hopefully a constructive discussion about what are WTO rules for from the perspective of development. Are WTO rules a constraint, which actually are too much limiting the policy space of developing countries? Or are rules there to help developing countries to further to integrate in the global trading system? And this is a debate that I think that needs to happen in Geneva and needs to happen in a more ideological and less uh, uh, confrontational manner. I mean, linked to this is, of course, the whole question of a special 
and differential treatment, which I know is a big priority for the United States. It is clear that, for instance, it makes no sense to imagine that you can negotiate any binding route uh, in the WTO and have a situation in which a country like China, which is weight uh, in the global economic system, can claim that they should uh, have a special and differential treatment. We have, by the way, at this point in time, an important testing ground on that uh, with the negotiations on fishery subsidies, uh, on which I think the critical issue to see whether we can conclude negotiations or not is going to depend. Can we find a way forward on the issue of special and differential treatment? And it is very clear that, uh, for instance, uh, a big uh, trading nation like China, which plays a fundamental role in the system, should be ready to be state very clearly and in a legally binding manner that it does not claim any special and differential treatment under the fishery subsidies agreement. So the whole uh, development uh, discussion is going to be one of the fundamental challenges for the agenda of WTO reform. My impression is that the perspectives of the United States and the European Union on these issues are uh, quite aligned. I wouldn't say that we would necessarily tactically agree on everything, but I, I would tend to think it's more tactical differences than fundamental strategic, uh, the fundamental strategic one. But the key is how to be able to engage uh, the developing countries in Geneva into a more forward-looking, more constructive discussion on development, something which is not just looking back in anger to the outcome of the Uruguay round, but it's much more looking forward with the current challenges for certain countries to better integrate in the global economy, what it is that a multilateral institution that the WTO can do to help those countries that really need to help in order to be better integrated in the global economy which is of course not the case for all developing countries and developing countries are already, I would say, quite well integrated. And uh, finally, probably the most difficult uh, challenge uh, are those issues which have to do with the level playing field. Those issues which have to do for how to ensure that uh, competition is not distorted through the interventions of the state uh, in the economy. These are issues that we started uh, already with the Trump administration to discuss with the United States uh, and with Japan in a trilateral format, and we have decided to renew uh, that work uh, uh, last year. But it really comes down to the issue how to modernize the rules of the WTO to ensure that when the state intervenes in the economy, it does it in a manner that, that does not create a competitive distortion. It is about subsidies, but it's not only about subsidies, because it's very clear that you actually identify what are, for instance, to be very, very blunt, uh, the problems about distortion of competition due to the role of the state in China, it is a much broader issue than simply the question of what is defined as a subsidy under the rules of the WTO. And I have talked about industrial subsidies, but I think we, I should not forget that the agricultural agenda continues to be very, very much at the center of the WTO. I mean, one of the issues that we are going to be discussing in two weeks' time in Geneva is, on the one hand, the immediate challenge of food security, how to avoid export restrictions, how to ensure transparency of markets. But beyond the immediate uh, challenges, there's going to be the question to, of how to advance in the process of agricultural reform. And certainly from the point of view of the European Union, we see a lot of merit and a lot of need to take further ste steps to reduce trade distorting the domestic support also in the agriculture, also in the agriculture sector. So, those are, if you want, uh, some of the issues which I think from the European point of view are important in terms of our WTO reform. These are not issues which are going to be solved in one day, and that's what I think is important to have the expectations about uh, what will happen uh, in Geneva in two weeks' time, right? It is starting a process, is to get in the organization to agree that the priority is to make the organization work, work better in response to these global trade challenges. And of course, all of this is going to happen in a very difficult uh, geopolitical environment, because as you know, one thing which is very clear to us is that it is not business as usual. We are certainly not going to be engaging uh, with the Russian Federation to, in the current context. But at the end of the day, whether we get into agreements or not uh, in two weeks' time in Geneva, it's not going to depend so much, quite frankly, on what is the position of Russia. It's going to depend about whether the United States, the European Union, China, and some key developing countries like India and South Africa can agree or not. I mean, if we can agree on issues like uh, the intellectual property response uh, to the pandemic, uh, uh, the challenge of food security, how to advance uh, on agricultural reform, and hopefully how to conclude the fisheries negotiation, 
I think those are things which are doable, but uh, it's clearly difficult because uh, the topics are difficult and the dynamics of a multilateral organization are, are always obviously quite, uh, quite challenging. So I think I would leave it uh, there. I'm very much looking forward to see what Kathleen has to say and to the debate. Many thanks, Ignacio, for this um, overview and, and, and indeed uh, outlining the, uh, the many issues and, and, and priorities on the EU side and the challenges. And I'm sure that we will pick up a few of these issues uh, during uh, the discussion. Um, but now I'm very happy to immediately uh, give the floor to uh, Kathleen for um, a US perspective or her views on the US perspective uh, on, uh, on these issues. Great. Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Guillaume. Thanks to you and Axel and the whole team for the invitation. It's great to be uh, in conversation with Ignacio in particular on, on uh, these issues. I always enjoy our, our conversations. Um, as you said, I, as I was asked to talk about the US position. Um, I will do so. There are, I see many on the call who will be familiar with uh, at least some of the groundwork that I will uh, lay. Um, and I, as you've mentioned, I'm drawing on my government experience, but speaking in a personal capacity to be sure. And I'm also going to echo much of what Ignacio said, hopefully not to repeat, but I, I do think it, um, we are at a moment, and I'll say more about this, that is reflective of some of the cooperation uh, he mentioned, Guillaume, you also mentioned this in your opening remarks. Um, and, and so I'll start with the dispute settlement mechanism, um, but then we'll e expand the conversation as Ignacio did to talk about other, other issues regarding the mission, the purpose of the organization and what we're trying to achieve both in, in two weeks time, but, but more broadly uh, as well. And I'll start also by saying that I think now is a great time to have this particular conversation because we're starting to see that movement that I think many have been waiting for for some time, right? We now have the US ambassador to the WTO installed in Geneva that took some time due to our uh, political process. The Senate has confirmed Ambassador Pagan a few months ago. She's there on the ground, able to engage more with her counterparts. Um, that of course was not a, a full pause because uh, you will know Ambassador Tai, the USTR went to Geneva within six months of becoming USTR. That was a trip that her predecessor never made. Um, so already then, I think we had uh, some, let's say, boost of confidence and, and, and indeed a commitment on the part of the US to be more engaged, some renewed hope for, for what the organization can achieve. Um, so now let me turn back to just a review for many of us of the US concerns, um, although quickly to say these you will know are not just US concerns, but have been raised by many members over the last uh, 25 years. And I'm not going to catalog them all in, in detail with all the experts we have, but let's just start with the basics of the appellate body. And, and I've tried to sort of lump these together in, in um, my prior work on, into four different crises that led to the, to the present stalemate on the appellate body. And I think it's worth going over these again in this moment, because these are the types of things that would need to be addressed if, and this is a big if, if we're going back to the way things used to be. More on that later. So the first crisis that I would refer to is something I call a constitutional crisis. This is the, the question um, about whether the appellate body exceeded its say, constitutional delegation. And that is really at the heart right, of what at least used to divide uh, the EU and the US and, and other members. Um, this is an ideological debate. Uh, we have countries like the US who think that the appellate body took an overly liberal or activist approach, uh, not only on substance, but also on the scope of its own interpretation, its authority. Um, the EU, on the other hand, had a different understanding of just what the system ought to be or, or what it ought to do. Uh, conservative reading on the part of the US, uh, a more expansive reading on the part of the EU. Um, I think those two poles have come closer together. We could talk more about why that might be, but that I think was the, the origin, part of the origin of, of the stalemate, um, which brings me to the second crisis of the four, uh, which was and remains a political crisis. Um, this was most shrill, I think, in the last administration, but we should be sure to remember it hasn't gone away. Uh, what do I mean by the political crisis? Here I'm thinking about something rather domestic, 
And that is, what does it mean for the United States to be able to do what it wishes in its economic policy and its global governance, uh, global economic governance approach? Um, can it operate, do what it needs, it feels it needs to do for its domestic constituency um, within or under the auspices of the WTO framework? And the, the recent Section 301 case is a good example of how this is still very present. Um, that is the case involving the tariffs on goods from China, where the US uh, lawmakers would say, we, we still need to be able to do this. We can't have Geneva telling us that we can't. So it's, and it's not just about these wins and losses. I think it's also about whether the WTO can be the vehicle for achieving what it is uh, that the US wants to achieve more broadly for addressing the problems that policymakers uh, see in, in the US. Third of the four crises is uh, perhaps the most important, which is the responsiveness uh, crisis. And I see three different manifestations of the responsiveness crisis that led us to the current point. Um, the first is a failure of the members to respond. That is, while these issues have been raised over the years, members were slow or not uh, present in, in engaging and responding to those concerns, and they just grew. Uh, second uh, responsiveness issue is the failure of adjudicators uh, and their staff, perhaps, to be attuned to this growing discontent and also to respond. Uh, and the third responsiveness issue is the failure of the negotiating rounds to, to address these same issues, to lead to meaningful reform, um, and, and so forth. Uh, the responsiveness crisis is related to the last crisis, which I call the structural crisis. And, and by this, I refer to something bigger than the WTO itself. That is the, something commentators have, have discussed in great detail at length, how WTO members' interests have diverged at the same time that global economic power has become more dispersed. And so we see how the mood on international institutions has changed. The climate is not such is where governments now can, are more skeptical uh, of certain types of binding and compulsory uh, international dispute settlement. Again, uh, familiar to you all. So all four of these crises, I think, led to where we are today. All four of them remain in different forms, uh, I think, top of mind uh, within the US system. Now, these are largely procedural issues, what I've referred to, but with substantive issues built in. Uh, Ignacio referred to some of them earlier, but we, we could certainly add that, that list, public bodies, zeroing, safeguards, to name a few. Um, this inadequacy of the WTO agreements to fully or appropriately address the, the problems of today. This goes far beyond the dispute settlement mechanism uh, or its workings. Um, and as, as many uh, US officials have said in recent years, they see the dispute settlement problem as just a symptom of these broader problems when, with the institution. So we focus on that, I think, because we see the organization as having become so litigation centered, but these other issues uh, also uh, special and differential treatment, the, the transparency and notification issues, issues that Ignacio mentioned, um, maybe a couple more that uh, I don't know if he mentioned, but the um, maybe self aggrandizement by the secretariat, as the US claims, um, this effect of this backward looking remedies, uh, as well as uh, generally dealing with non market economy. So we, we you all could could surely add more to the list, but those are those are just a few. Uh, here I would add that even if our future looking reform is able to address some of these issues, all of these issues, um, I think there remains at least two major normative questions that members need to be thinking about. And my fear is that we, we return to those crises, at least on the part of the United States, if these are not somehow addressed and, and how we address them is something to think a lot more about. Um, the first question, big picture question is, um, what is it that we want members to be able to do within this multilateral system? If they suddenly face an unfair trade practice by a trading partner that's not covered by whatever rules we come up with, what should govern in the absence of rules for practices that come along that we can't anticipate now? We need some sort of system to deal with that and one that's going to work. And you can see how that's tied up with a lot of what we've already said. The second big picture question is related. It's what can members do when they face a, an unreasonable or unfair trading practice that, that is covered by the rules, but which becomes too difficult or um, 
unable, they're unable to, to prove in whatever dispute settlement system we may set up. Um, so those two questions in the absence of rules and also in the absence of procedures to accommodate uh, those sorts of disputes, we need a, a sort of backup plan right? and something that I, I think we all need to think more about. Only once those questions are answered, can we make progress, I think, on these broader architectural issues, or at least be able to move forward with the substantive issues uh, under uh, some uh, functional system that we would devise. So where do we go? I'm, I'm going to throw out uh, sort of five different things that, that I suspect um, my former colleagues are, are thinking about, um, but none of these is necessarily mutually exclusive and, and surely we could come up with variations on all of them. Um, the first is, is I'm going to move into sort of levels of uh, uh, severity or, or comprehensiveness. Uh, the first is what I call the Walker Principles Plus. This, this you will all know the, the Walker Principles, the sort of uh, procedural fixes to address some of the concerns the U.S. and others had, um, but which fell flat, I, th I think we can say, uh, and, and, and were insufficient to address U.S. concerns. So the Walker Principles plus something more uh, would be a way to restart dispute settlement without getting into these other issues. And that's sort of uh, the lowest hanging fruit, perhaps, right, if we're going to go down this dispute settlement revival road. Option two in the menu is, is, I think, dealing with the dispute settlement issues, so Walker plus, um, but also trying to undertake some reform to some of the substantive rules or making advances on the ones, the new ones that are being discussed. Right? There also seems to be some low hanging fruit among the issues that, that Ignacio referred to and that we can see are moving along uh, in plurilateral or multilateral fashion. Um, option three goes bigger and broader still, right, where we see a reform package that is more comprehensive in nature, that, that doesn't start dispute settlement without also addressing the deep-seated other issues that we've referred to, whether it's SNDT, whether it's subsidies, um, services, tech, we could, we could add to that list what would be in the big uh, umbrella that would we want to see reformed. Uh, that's sort of the pinnacle of the menu. And now my last two maybe move us in a direction um, that I would suspect the EU is, is less interested to take. Um, the fourth option I would say is, is actually not do anything with dispute settlement and actually sort of leave the, the panel system as it is today, the single, uh, single step, right, single uh, institution process, uh, and then address these other things instead. Let's just focus on, on uh, rule development uh, and the negotiating function and do and, and these other functions of the organization do less or, or nothing more with, with dispute settlement. Um, option five uh, is to do even less than that, which is to walk further away from the WTO as being that multilateral institution that can respond to global challenges that Ignacio outlined. Uh, Ignacio mentioned that in his view that there's not much else there to fill that gap. Of course, there are others vying for the honor, if we can call it that, right? That is, whether it's the OECD, where I think you feel uh, a threat to the relevance, some feel this way of the WTO uh, in OECD filling the gap on some issues, but the obvious response to that, uh, I suspect, is that the OECD is a far cry from the WTO, and indeed, as a matter of, of course, institutional design, that's true, but in terms of being responsive to some global challenges, maybe we see things, see things go elsewhere. Of my five menu options, none of them is clearly the path that I think the Biden administration wishes to adopt, but, but I think they, are, they each have pieces that have been thought through within the administration. They're in conversation. We saw the US mentioned earlier this week at the DSB meeting that adopting panel reports is a sign the dispute settlement is still working. Um, clearly though, there's still more work to be done. Uh, I'll just end by saying, I think we, we have come to a place where, where I began, that is, um, we're not as far apart as we used to be. Uh, the WTO is not the battlefield that I think it was four years ago as part of the, the trade war as it, as it was begun. Uh, we heard Ambassador Tai say this, um, I think this was back in her October speech, where she said, um, we, we want to we want to commit to and innovate in terms of being a member of the WTO. We want to seek to bring reform to the WTO 
But then she also said, we need to be agile and open-minded to think outside of the box as to how we can address and be more effective in addressing concerns that we've been struggling to address on trade. And, and she said outright there, and of course meant China. Uh, so China remaining at the center of US geopolitical and, and geoeconomic policy targets um, will mean that, and, and the WTO's, I would say, um, less than satisfactory record in addressing those concerns makes it difficult to, to put full energy on the part of the United States into to WTO reform. Well, both Chinese officials and US officials have said this has to happen elsewhere. So the very last thing I'll say is I think it's worth stepping back and asking the big question of what is it we're doing here? Uh, and I think Ignacio sort of highlighted the EU position on this question. It's a question that goes beyond my mandate uh, for today's conversation, but it's the existential one for members, right? That is, they convene for the ministerial. Will they answer it? No, there's a minimal agenda, as we, we heard. Um, but, but I think it's one that's, that's really deeply in, ingrained in the minds of U.S. policymakers, even if it's not top of mind for them. And frankly, even if they lack the capital to be able to invest more in thinking about this critical issue, what are we doing here with this institution? Institution. But it's one that I, I hope they address before our very important 2024 presidential election. Okay, that's a, an important issue that you end with uh, as well. So many thanks, uh, Kathleen. And also um, to mention these two broader issues, what to do in absence of rules and in absence of procedures. I think these are very important um, questions. So actually, I can uh, already invite, uh, I will be blunt, we want to tap into your both of your brains as much as possible in, in the time that we have. So uh, I can only invite the uh, participants to um, already um, raise questions in, in, in a short and snappy way as well. Uh, and please mention maybe your affiliation as well when you ask questions and avoid lengthy uh, comments, please. Um, and to give uh, the audience some time to uh, put this on paper. Um, maybe I, I, I start maybe with two brief uh, specific questions, uh, something that Ignacio started with and, and Kathleen, you uh, covered quite in detail. It's, it's a dispute settlement issue. You mentioned it as one of the issues on your menu. So the question is maybe to both of you, is this a, an appetizer that needs to be consumed before making progress on other issues? Is this really for the EU um, a condition tackling the dispute settlement before um, being able uh, or willing to cover the other issues in, in, in detail? And there, um, I mean, I think a lot of observers are still surprised. I think last week there was a, a dispute settlement committee where the U.S. representative, again, said basically nothing. Um, uh, there was one important and, uh, and novelty, I think, that um, the U.S. is actually welcoming, uh, welcoming the new development that's in some uh, panels. Actually, the parties uh, decide not to appeal and maybe go and on an out of the WTO track with the procedures that we now have. Um, but uh, it was remarkable, I think, that the, um, the the U.S. representative was welcoming this to keep it at a panel level, and is this indicating maybe that for the U.S. Um, they really don't want to have a two-tire system, which is something that uh, Ignacio mentioned that for the EU would be really, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, a uh, condition sine qua non. Is this, in, is this something where uh, finally maybe we have a specific position from the US because we know the concerns that they have put on paper and you zoomed out even a bit more, uh, but we still actually are waiting for some concrete uh, proposals on, 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 on that issue. Uh, that's one uh, question to, to both of you. And secondly, um, maybe a more specific question on MC12, uh, which I think we can uh, we can be sure in the answers. There was some discussion on what actually the outcome document could or should be. Um, do we go for a ministerial declaration, which requires consensus, but then we have now the discussions uh, whether WTO members will be able to have consensus in the light of, I mean, the conflict in Russia to have all WTO members on board to have actually um, a ministerial statements that addresses directly or indirectly, I mean, uh, the the, uh, the Russia's invasion in, in, in Ukraine. Um, or do we go for a second best option, a kind of a, um, a summary of the chair and then some joint statements? Basically, my question, without going into the technical details, is this an important discussion? Does this matter? Does this make, or will, could, could this, or will this make a difference in practice, what the outcome document will be or, um, or not? So, um, these are already maybe two questions maybe that we can start with and I give and also actually I obviously let you react to each other um so maybe st we start first again with Ignacio and then Kathleen and in the meantime I, I collect already some uh, some other questions so please Ignacio uh shoot 
Well, I mean, you have raised so many questions and Kathleen has said so many things I would like to comment that is a little bit of a challenge. Let me just uh, telegraphically make uh, four points. Now, the first one, to, I mean, it's very, very clear to, that WTO reform has to be a process which is uh, quite broad, but at the same time, it would be a big mistake uh, to try to lump everything together and to try to introduce a single undertaking type of approach on WTO reform. I mean, there are challenges are many. Some of them have to do with the negotiating function. Some to do have to do with the monitoring and deliberating function. And there's the issue of dispute settlement. Now, I don't want to prejudge what would be agreed in the two weeks time in NC12, but my sense is that WTO members in principle would be in agreement that there needs to be a very broad WTO reform mandate that really allows to cover the whole range of issues which are needed uh, to tackle the, the situation of the organization. But at the same time, there has to be a very specific and priority mandate on trying to find a way forward to have again a fully functioning the dispute settlement system in the WTO. So that's where I see at this point in time the, the balance uh, being. Now, trying to put that in connection with the many different options that Kathleen uh, mentioned. Now, from the European Union, it is very clear to, that uh, reform of dispute settlement uh, to work uh, would have to be more ambitious than simply reiterating the worker principles uh, with a little addition to here and there. Now, we obviously have some points which are very fundamental to us, and I mentioned those before. But beyond that, I think we really come to this discussion to, with an open mind to see how we can have a system that works better, that it is uh, more efficient, but at the same time, it's fully legitimate uh, both in the United States and in other members of the WTO. And we are quite open to, to have a serious discussion to see what are the kind of changes that are necessary to achieve that goal. Now, I would really think, however, that it would be important uh, to engage on these issues with a certain uh, political sense of urgency, of importance, about trying to find a way forward on this way before the end of the Biden, uh, of the Biden administration, since I think uh, Kathleen was also referring to the political calendar with which uh, we are actually, which we are actually uh, working. Now, I found it interesting, this reference uh, to some panels that have been adopted. It might be useful to mention these were two panels where appeal was an option because there was the MPIA or there were alternative arbitration agreements. And despite that, there was no appeal because both sides came to the view that the outcome of the panel was sufficiently balanced and satisfactory not to exercise the option of appeal. But these were two cases in which appeal was actually an option. And we continue to think that an appeal phase is an essential part of a working dispute settlement procedure which doesn't mean to say that we can just simply go back to the way that the upper body used to work. There are going to have to be significant uh, changes agreed to have agreed an upper body which is politically broadly acceptable to, for the WTO for the WTO to, uh, members. Now, I think that then you raise an issue which is a little bit more technical, but of course it is one of the fundamental questions that we're going to have to be tackling to, in the two weeks time. Now, the critical issues that we are going to be discussing are multilateral in nature. I mean, there are some things that would be agreed uh, bilaterally, but the fundamental question that we are discussing in two weeks time is can we agree on a waiver uh, of WTO obligations in connection with certain aspects of intellectual property rights? That is a multilateral procedure to, under WTO. Can we agree on a political declaration to, on to the response to the pandemic and on the challenges of food security? Can we agree to conclude a multilateral negotiation which is the fisheries subsidies negotiation? So all those issues are issues that in principle require the consensus in the WTO. You cannot agree if a member of the WTO objects and indicates that they are not ready, they are not ready to, to agree. Now, quite frankly, at this point in time, we are working towards the objective of seeing the what agreements can be reached by consensus, although I've indicated before, it is clear that there's a limit about uh, what things can be done on the basis of the principle of consensus. And that part of the way of the reform of the WTO 
is also going to be to have more flexibility to conclude certain issues on the basis of uh, plurilateral uh, of plurilateral uh, uh, agreements. And finally, just to indicate, I mean, no one is saying that the WTO is the only institution that matters globally. I mean, there are certain things that can be done in other institutions. The OECD developed very strong disciplines on issues relating to business taxation. There are certain issues which can be developed in places other than the WTO, but we still think that there has to be a basic core multilateral set of rules to which all members of the global trading system are committed to. And that's basically what only the WTO provides, because quite frankly, I do not really see at this point in time the political appetite to go towards the WTO 2.0. I mean, I know that sometimes this is part of the political debate, including the, in the United States, that we actually create a totally new institution and forget about the WTO. Quite frankly, I don't see that the political conditions for that uh, kind of exercise are there. And of course, it would actually create a huge fragmentation of the global trading system, which I don't think that anyone would really want, wish to, to, to contemplate. Uh, so I think I would leave it there. Many thanks. Ignacio, actually, then, yeah, I immediately give the floor back to, to Kathleen. Just, just briefly, I, I, told, I agree entirely with Ignacio's point about um, trying to do a lot together. I, I think that there will, choices will need to be made even within that uh, particular option on the, on the menu that I, I laid out, priorities within the list of reforms. But, but I think that's the hardest part uh, for the Biden administration, at least, right? to try and identify what those priorities ought to be, uh, what best serves its interests going forward. Um, it's something that was discussed at length as the Biden administration was coming in uh, and, and something that I think is still, we still don't have uh, maybe a clear sense. Part of that, uh, we haven't talked about this and this gets a bit more in the weeds, but part of that has to do with the way trade policy is being developed within the US government right now. Um, as many will know, this is not a, a high priority as a general matter uh, for the Biden administration. Uh, so the mandate for USTR, while the tariffs are continuing and so forth, it, it, it's, it's difficult to, to pinpoint to land on a particular priority list, I think, within that. But clearly, starting the appellate body is not high on that list, whereas other menus or other menu items uh, will remain, I think, higher. Um, and, and simply on the question of the outcome documents and, and what we're expecting, I'm saying, um, Certainly, perhaps this goes without saying, as a matter of sort of U.S. public and and uh, what's happening uh, now is, is in U.S. high priority policy issues. It, it will not be something that is uh, high on that list. Um, but as a signaling function, I think for for some trade watchers and for some of those broader public policy issues that Ignacio mentioned, uh, that will be important, in, in, at least in that respect. Many thanks. Um, sorry. Am I still muted? No, I think you can hear me now. Okay. Um, many thanks. Sorry. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I collect some questions. I see that we have a nice combination of some uh, technical questions and some, some broader issues. So um, we are with a few uh, legal birds here. So I, I, I think that's fine. But maybe I start with um, um, one question, which was already from uh, Joel Trachtman, which was already, um, I think, sort of less uh, mentioned, but uh, maybe not in detail is, um, can, the question is, can sufficient uh, reform be agreed through uh, package agreements that achieve consensus, or will other mechanisms, including but not limited to plurilateral agreements, be needed? And maybe if I can add a, a question on that, and in the sense that, I mean, as already Ignacio mentioned, there are some uh, WTO members, India, South Africa, for example, as we know, that have some concerns on, on integrating plurilateral uh, agreements. And um, could this be a part of WTO form as well, that you establish some principles beyond what is actually already in the agreements, but that you agree on some key principles that need to be established before, I mean, these plurilateral agreements can be fully integrated. Um, and what, do, what, what could, well, I mean, what could these principles be? That's maybe one um, question. Then uh, a second question from uh, Elisa Baroncini from uh, University of uh, Bologna. Um, if I can uh, summarize, she's referring to the trade policy review that suggested uh, a new WTO committee to be composed by representatives from business community and civil society to discuss uh, WTO issues. So she's basically asking um, whether or not this has already been proposed and what are the reactions of other WTO members 
uh, and is something happening on, on that specific um, uh, proposal to include, I mean, uh, broader stakeholders and, and a kind of the WTO uh, committee? That's the second question. And then um, we have uh, a third question, uh, and then I, I give you the floor back from uh, James uh, Flat. And obviously, we have some more technical questions from, from, uh, from that direction. Um, Therefore, I will just uh, basically read the question out loud because it will be if, if I summarize it, or maybe we'll make mistakes. So basically, he's asking that uh, because of Article 17.2 uh, of the second sentence of the dispute settlement understanding on introducing a staggered applet body appointments, um, that is only applied when the Blue Two members entered uh, into force. Uh, he's basically asking how appointing seven applet body members for four years to clear uh, the black lock and see how it goes, and then we would be back to um, today. I think you can see the question if I'm not summarizing it in a, in a correct way, but uh, I think you can um, right. see the question. So maybe we will start with these three questions and then uh, we can pick up later. Or please, if the authors of the questions want to have a follow-up question, please uh, do so in, in, in the chat box. So um, maybe we could start again, basically with uh, Ignacio and then uh, pause the floor to Kathleen. Uh, okay, well, actually, three, three very good uh, questions. Uh, now, on the question by Joel, uh, well, when I was in a more academic type of capacity, I think one of the ideas that I wrote in a paper is, can we actually try to agree on certain principles for open plurilateral agreements to be integrated uh, in the WTO? Having been involved for two years in the reality of WTO discussions, of WTO negotiations, I have to say, I have become much less uh, uh, much less confident that that type of approach is going to actually work in practice. I think I tend to think that in certain cases you need to reform by doing things. Now, as I said, you have at this point in time uh, more than 120 members, if my memory is correct, uh, negotiating an investment facilitation agreement, and a little bit less uh, members negotiating uh, an e-commerce uh, agreement. Now. And, what, and this, by the way, are negotiations which are open to participation by any WTO member. Uh, and there are negotiations that once an agreement is concluded, I'm sure it will be possible for the members to, in these negotiations to show that the interests of non-participants are in no way being harmed. Now, if you actually have that situation, I think you really need to test the, the rules of the WTO. The rules of the WTO have a procedure to incorporate uh, Plurilateral agreements into WTO, Annex 4, which requires a consensus. Now, then I think in my view, will be to say which is the country which is going to oppose the possibility of including those agreements uh, into the WTO if they actually have very substantial membership. They are open to any member joining the, the WTO. And you can clearly show that uh, the interests of non participants are not being harmed. It may well still be that some countries will decide to block. But then I think they will have the political responsibility for having taken uh, that step. So in an ideal world, I think, uh, yes, it will be interesting to see where we can all agree on some principles, on some criteria. I'm not sure, quite frankly, where that is going, what going to happen in the next uh, two years. But at the same time, I think that we really need to test the system and we need uh, to be able to, to show we have a very substantial part uh, of the WTO membership, by the way, including the, in several of these, both the United States and uh, China. Uh, we all feel that it makes sense to develop rules in these areas. If a country wants to block this, it would really need to explain the reasons why it is blocking it. And then if that is the case, we would need to see what are the options which are open to, at that particular uh, point in time. Now, on the question by Els Lisa, I mean, I'm not sure that I remember having put forward a proposal to create a new committee in the WTO. This being said, it is very clear that uh, we will be very interested in finding practical ways to have more engagement uh, of civil society and the business community in the work of the WTO. At this point in time, the only real opportunity for that engagement is the WTO Public Forum, which is a very interesting institution. But I think we will certainly be interested to see where there is the appetite in the WTO to find more ways uh, for WTO members to, to engage with the business community 
and with organization of civil society. And of course, if those insertion things cannot be done formally in Geneva, there's a lot of things which can be done informally or can be done uh, domestically. I mean, certainly, as far as the European Union is concerned, as we advance in the process of WTO reform, we will be very interested in having the domestic consultations to try to see how to take into account different interests in the context of the WTO agenda. Now, I'm not sure that I have in front of me well, I mean, I know I think that I understand the question that the AMC is driving at. Well, obviously, the first question is uh, to try to find uh, the basis uh, to agree to restore uh, a procedure of appointment uh, of, of upper body members. I mean, I cannot remember James, exactly how this was done in the first, uh, when the first upper body was created. What for me it is very clear is that making the right choices in terms of getting the right people to, to have this new upper body is going to be probably as important as defining the, the balance of what adjustments on the rules we need to introduce. I think a new upper body is going to have to demonstrate that there is a change, that is a change of adjudicative approach. And I think that from that point of view, selecting the right members for this upper body is going to be, I think, extremely, extremely important. Many thanks, Ignacio. Please, Kathleen, uh, go. Um, so so uh, first, thanks to these three uh, experts for, for the questions. Um, so I, I want to go to Ignacio's comment in response to Joel about the plurilaterals. Uh, I think it really depends what our goals are. Right? We, we, I think we have to be open to that. And I, I, I understand uh, Ignacio's pessimism, but, but uh, I recognize the shortcomings for sure of the approach. But, but I think it also could be very useful in developing uh, principles, with, which you acknowledge, Ignacio. But the, the fact that it happens in the WTO, under the WTO, umbrella or in that context, I think is itself important. Um, we are right now in the US in this mode of creating endless dialogues, councils and frameworks to talk about trade issues, uh, but they're all outside the, the WTO system, as you know. So, so having some greater emphasis on plurilateral development, I think is a way to advance the WTO agenda and relevance in a time where other things are not working. Uh, on uh, Elisa's uh, important question, I, I can't uh, speak to that particular uh, committee. I don't have any special insights on what the U.S. view is, but it's very much in the spirit, I think, of what the, the Biden administration is seeking to achieve more broadly in trade policy. You see similar efforts domestically in what USTR is doing, uh, trying to bring in more voices to the trade policy development conversation. So um, that, that sounds promising. Uh, and to James, I can be succinct uh, in, in his uh, always thoughtful questions. Unsurprisingly, I am skeptical about both. Okay, thanks for that uh, shortest happy answer uh, or last answer. So um, actually, unfortunately, we run out of uh, time and we think it's important that basically we end, we end also um, on time. Obviously, I, we could have discussed all these issues much longer and, and further, but I'm sure that, I mean, we at GLOBE will uh, cook up some new webinars on these issues. And I'm sure that we will see both Ignacio and Kathleen in different capacities and in different um, events discussing these issues uh, before and then most likely uh, also after MC12. Uh, for sure, if uh, WTO members agree on all these issues in the same way as our panelists uh, did today, then MC12 will be a walk in the park, but I think uh, this most likely will not be uh, that case. So then I can only thank both Ignacio and, and Kathleen very much for being here, for sharing your thoughts, and um, then uh, also for the participants, for their questions and, uh, uh, and, and comments. And um, then I can only wish you a nice um, afternoon, sunny uh, in, in Brussels or wherever you are, and uh, that we all keep in touch uh, on these or other trade related issues. Many thanks. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.